Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to Talent Finders podcast. Um, today, uh, we sit down with an amazing and incredibly talented entrepreneur and founder uh, and owner of Chef Lizette uh, Entertainment. So welcome, Lizette, uh, to Talent Finders podcast, uh, and thanks for giving me your time. Thank you for having me. So to start off, um, let's start at the beginning. Uh, where did your journey start um, as a chef and entrepreneur? Um, and was this something that you always knew you wanted to pursue? Uh, so if you could just give us a bit of background, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. So it's so interesting. Where, where did it begin? I would say at 11 years old, um, I was in client services, which is AKA known for babysitting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I immediately just loved And listen, when you're 11 years old, you don't know how to calibrate or even think for yourself that you're an entrepreneur. You know, you just, I just instinctively loved making my own money, but more than just making my own money, I liked the sense that people put trust in me and that it allowed me to be responsible. I mean, like that much I do remember way back then, right? Because I, there's no way that I would have, have had the intelligence to calibrate and say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Yes. But I just loved that. And of course I babysat for my parents. They're, you know, like their dear friends, their little kids. Yeah. And so I just loved, I mean, listen, I was 11 years. So think about today in today's world, an 11 year old, right? Yeah. Ta taking care of. So my friends, my, my parents, friends at the time, uh, Jamie and Kristen, shout out to them, got a nowling. I hope that, you know, they hear this at some point, that would be extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, so Jamie was, under five years old from what I remember and Kristen was just born so under a year old so can you imagine letting an 11 year old take care of a five-year-old and a one-year-old I mean just just imagine and so yeah. I mean we're it was just different times there was a level of expectation you know that you just you did the right thing and yeah. so I love and, I trust. Loved, and, and trust. trust. Like yeah. trust was given a lot more freely. And I think that when you give trust freely, it allows the person to step up yes. and to really show you who they are right from the start without having to earn it. I mean, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, like he's talked about that, how he gives trust freely. And there's something really powerful about that. When you give trust first, yeah, it raised it raises the bar and it allows a comfort level and wiggle room, which is my favorite word, to give people the freedom and license to show you who they are. Absolutely. So at 11 years old, you know what I mean? So at yeah. 11 years old, I was already given that level of trust and mm -hmm. I did not want to disappoint my parents and I did not want to disappoint the people who were paying me, you know, For sure. And do you find, obviously, it was also probably a, a confidence um, booster for you as well? Because, oh, you know, for that's sure. also for important. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, more than anything, like more than the, more than the uh, equation of making money at the end of that day, okay. what, what I remember still, like what stays with me, because of course, I don't even remember how much money I made. I don't. I remember that I was very feisty about charging my own prices. <laughs> yes. So I, I do I do remember that I immediately loved negotiating without yes. even knowing what negotiating was. Like my parents were like, oh, you know, charge them very little. And yes. I was like, wait a minute, like, like this is my client. I, and of course I didn't say this at 11, but yes. like I was feisty. So at 11, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the one doing the work. So I should be naming the price you know, for sure. And, and so I loved that ownership. And I loved that confidence builder. And I loved again, the responsibility that was given to me to have to take care of really young kids. When I was a kid myself, I was 11. Yes, absolutely. So 
Uh, the next question I wanted to ask you. So um, I read that you cooked uh, for over 5 million people over your career, which yes. is incredible. Can you please tell us more about that? So, yeah, it's, it's way more than 5 million because when I think about 28 years yeah. and there were so many events that I was, you know, one of the event managers or captains or leads on the party not necessarily a chef mm. um, because i've done both back of the house and front of the house so it's it's really been it's really been hard for me to calculate just how many people i have fed or have been a part of the experience yeah because there were some events that were large you know huge events fundraisers yeah or or you know like e3 or ecom or some of the biggest conferences in the world Yes. Um, you know, where thousands of people, hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of people come through there. Yeah. So, it, you know, right down to a small little dinner party for five people. So I've done everything in between. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, from very high end to like the most exclusive parties in Hollywood, uh, like the Oscars and pretty much every award show that goes through Hollywood, I've been a part of them. Wow, the that's Grammys, amazing. the Oscars. Yeah, just it's it's been extraordinary. Like it's really it's so interesting because sometimes I need to remind myself because so here's the interesting thing because you and I are very into social social media, right? Yeah, for and sure. <laughs> and I just wish to I really wish to God that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, like my career would look very, very different if I actually was able to capture those moments and record. And I mean, you know, clearly we had cameras back in the day of to be able to take pictures, but yes. for so many, of, well, not for so many events, for all of the events, especially the Hollywood related ones, yes. you know, we had, we had to sign waivers and you could not take pictures. And, and so even for me, like I wasn't raised like that. You know what I mean? It just wasn't in my mindset that, oh, I'm going to take a picture with all of these celebrities. Like to me, they were just another human being yeah. that was clear, that was clearly very successful. Um, so like very early on, and this is kind of a, this is a segue, but it is part of my, my career. Uh, yeah. My sister really was tenacious. Like she's a lawyer. She's a very successful lawyer in Seattle. And so from a very young age, she actually probably planted the seed in me of how to reach out to what you would call influencers, what we call today influencers. Influencers, for sure. And she was very tenacious in getting to the people that she wanted that inspired her. Yay. So Jim, Jimmy, you know, President Jimmy Carter was one of them. And uh, the L.A. Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda and Fernando Valenzuela were huge for her she was obsessed wow and so she was just very uh relentless about which is why she makes such a good lawyer <laughs> yeah. she would write <laughs> you know she would write letters to these folks just trying to get their attention not necessarily for any reason but more to say i admire you and all of that yeah back in the days when they so were still uh when they yeah were still allowed yes. <laughs> Exactly. So just imagine how long that took to get a response, right? Because it's yeah. a handwritten letter or whatever. Yes. But she she wrote several. I don't remember how many, but clearly enough to get the attention of Dodgers and Fernando Valenzuela. So for the Pasadena Rose Parade one year, where Fernando Valenzuela was on one of the floats, and I don't remember, I, like, I don't remember how old I was. I have a picture of it. Um, but we were able to get invited to, like, you know, the VIP little breakfast or whatever before the Rose Parade. And yes. Fernando Valenzuela was there. And so we have a picture, like, the whole family with him and my sister. You can see her huge smile on her face. Wow. And, you know, and you see, like, like, and I 
have a huge smile on my face, but it was just like such a happy moment that at that time, and I was definitely under 14, that I do remember. Yeah. I, like, I don't remember calibrating, oh, this is a famous person. Yeah. Oh, let's, we're taking a picture with this person. I just remember that we were all very happy. You know? Yeah, well, it's, a, and it's here's, I guess it's, it's moments like that that you only when you reflect back on them, do you realize the significance. Because I've sure. had moments like that as well, you know, like featuring in O Magazine and then not, you know, not that I didn't value it at the time, but it's like now that media and everything has come to the forefront, it's right. like now you can actually leverage those moments. For sure. Well, for sure. And I almost miss that. Um, the days of of just the pure simplicity of because to me like now reflecting that moment i saw that as like a hallmark moment for my sister of what she accomplished to get the attention of her hero which was fernando valenzuela wow um you know like the same thing so my grandfather was in the mexican government at that time like years ago again this is another quick story so he was around, you know, politicians and just Hollywood royalty, if you will, at that time. And I remember him taking me to, and again, it's like the memories are very lucid and I don't remember all the details, but it must have been like a pre-screening of a movie that Bob Hope was in. Wow. Because I remember he took us. And so just like you would see today, like the red carpet moments. Yeah. I was there with the red carpet moment of Bob Hope. Like, can you imagine? Wow. And like, and I probably saw him for a millisecond, but yeah. I'll, I'll never forget that. And so like those moments early on, I think are what young people today are trying to achieve. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's amazing. I mean, incredible uh, highlights for sure. So yeah, and so like how that parlays into my in my career as a chef and being around, you know, the most prolific actors, athletes, business leaders, presidents, royalty, digni dignitaries. I I planned I told those little stories in the beginning because it was planted in me. I, and I really think that like every, you know, like the your life and the energy of life yeah. like everything is working in order right yes, and so to, so to me i think that the universe just naturally put me into the environment that i've been in because they were just so organic like i just fit right in you know for me to be at the oscars to be next to oprah winfrey to be with you know, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, you know, mm. President Barack Obama, like all of these folks, I just feel comfortable. Like, I don't see them as different from me. And I think they probably respect that more than people who get like overly excited around. Well, you know, for, the for sure. So for sure. I mean, I will tell you, and this is actually a fun little story that I've never really shared because I was embarrassed um but I was I was so geeked out that I lost I lost myself right because again I'm always very good in in environments with the most influential people I just like I don't get starstruck and I'm yeah. telling you I've been around like the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela and like my goddess which is Oprah like yeah. you know like I've, I've been I've been around everyone but I'm a total geek of Goodfellas, the movie. Yes. Like, it's, I'm obsessed with that movie. It's, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And I'm also just obsessed with Robert De Niro. Like, there's not one movie that he's made that I don't absolutely love. Um, I mean, to me, it's like such a close tie between Casino and Goodfellas, you know, yes. which, which to me are like probably my favorite movies of his. Uh, but then like, Awakening, like, well, anyways, all of his movies are sensational, but I happened to be working an award show by Spike TV, and I don't remember what the show is. It's like a do, I don't know, it's like a an award show for guys giving away award. I, I don't know. Anyways, 
but on this particular, um, and it was the the show was being taped at Sony Studios. So on this particular award show, they were celebrating and honoring the 25th anniversary of Goodfellas, the movie. And so lo and behold, I'm in charge of the VIP room, of the green room for this award. You know, so everyone who is going to be presenting or whatever, they go to the green room. And I'm telling you, everyone was there. Mike Tyson was there, Leonardo DiCaprio, and I don't know how many others. But to me, like the room just became silent when Ray Liotta and Robert De Niro walked in. Like, I didn't know they were wow. gonna be there. And, Amazing. You know, and John, yeah, and John Pesci wasn't there, or I mean, Joe Pesci. But the two of them were going to, I guess, receive an award or talk about Goodfellas, right? Yeah. Um, and I just lost it. I, I just lost myself because again, like when you're working those events, you're under really strict restrictions that you can't ask for an autograph. You can't take a picture. Yes. I mean, like you're, re you're really subject to getting fired. Um, yeah. And I, and I totally respect that because that's the way it should be. Right. Yes. I mean, like, otherwise they'd never get their job be, done. Right. <laughs> well, exactly. And I yeah. mean, I really just believe in privacy. I believe in everyone's right to privacy. Yeah. Um, and I was the manager at in the green room. So what kind of example am I leading to, you know, to be geeking out? But it was Robert De Niro and Ray Liotta <laughs> for my, you know what I mean? Like for Amazing. my favorite movie of all time. And so I did ask, <laughs> I did ask them for an autograph and, you know, and Robert De Niro didn't seem quite so delighted with me, which is fine. I mean, I totally respected that. Yes. But sure. that was my that was my only geeked out moment. Um, wow. And so, you know, so it, can I ask you what is your what was your greatest highlight in your career? Like what is? Oh been my like god! Well, that's definitely one highlight. of that's definitely one of them. Okay, I mean, that that for sure is massive. Yeah. Um, and thank God that that moment happened before I actually was. I mean, like I've been around Oprah many times, and. You have to, I mean, I have to set the stage for Oprah because she has literally been a co designer of my life. She hasn't changed my life. She's literally been a co producer of my life. Like, yeah. aside from God and my parents and my grandparents and godparents, there's no one on the face of this earth mm. that has impacted my life more than Oprah. I mean, I would say second to Oprah is Julia Child. And wow. that's, you know, like, Amazing. but. Oprah, I mean, I literally have been learning. I've been a student of Oprah since I was 17. Yeah, I mean, no, imagine. I'm the same. I'm the same. She, for me, yeah, she's I the mean, most iconic and influential. And for really sure. Kind of I, um, in everything that she does, from a spiritual to just giving to, you know, impacting people. Well, I mean, listen, she's, I, 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 this entire interview could be about Oprah, but I, <laughs> what, I can tell, yeah. what I can tell you is that I just turned 48. Yeah. And so just imagine over three decades to be learning from someone. And, you know, I love that she has been such a pioneer way before this social media game. Absolutely. Not just, not just showing women, because that's, that goes without, that goes without saying yes. how much she has done for women. Sure. But just in speaking in terms of media, okay, wow. because I think that that's, probably the tone of whoever listens to your podcast, she has been at the forefront of constantly evolving in her craft and constantly pushing the envelope of who she is as a woman, as a businesswoman. And, and, and so I say all of that because I don't think that she has the kudos, quite honestly, that she, that she garnered a, be, when she had her show like yes. when she was in the front of faces every single day yeah uh she you know she, you could say she was at the top of her game but to me she's always been at the top of her game because she's just constantly evolving and pushing the envelope to where she wants to navigate herself absolutely uh, and I, mean, so, I think one of the things that that sticks with me that she said um, is that 
sometimes when you're in process um, to something greater, because obviously her um, her vision has always been about uh, creating a legacy and creating something bigger than who she is. So right. I think one of the things um, as a as a female entrepreneur for myself that resonates with me is that sometimes when you're in a process or in when you're in something, you don't understand why you're in it at that period of time, but it's all in preparation for something greater. For and sure. I, that's the thing from that amongst many other things, but for sure those things. Well, and I'll tell you, I mean, and I'll tell you my high, one of my career highlights, which speaks to Oprah, but, you know, just in going back, I credit her for my life in the most unique circumstance in that I really think I was already born with this, but yes. she made it feel okay, which is what made her just a God to me. And that is that she stands so confident yeah. in not having gotten married. You know what well, I mean? Sure. And, and navigating her career through the pressure, through the social judgment of what it means to not be married and have kids. Right? Absolutely. And so for me, being born in a Mexican culture, mm. that's just so against the grain. It's just Absolutely. so, like you're just an old spinster you're just a ha like you're just a forgotten human being as a Mexican woman mm -hmm. if you're not married and have kids. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Right. And and it doesn't mean that I don't want those things. It just means that I've always known since day one. Like it's so interesting. Like since a little kid, I've always yeah. known that I was never going to settle. I was never just going to get hitched for the sake of getting hitched. You know. You and of course. Both. You and me both. Right. I mean, and I, th I think that, you know, I think that that seed was planted in me yeah. to therefore be able to focus on doing good work, right? Absolutely. But aside from that, like, Oprah made it feel normal. She was the only human being on the face of this earth in the 80s and 90s and mm. 2000s, like all of those decades that I have learned from her, that was the shining example of what it looks like to be be functioning, happy, yeah. healthy, and and proud to be a woman. And now it doesn't mean that she doesn't have Stedman and is not in love. You know what I mean? Like she's had love and has love, but she just made it feel so comfortable yeah. that you could focus on yourself as a woman. Yeah. And by doing so, then clearly you become the best version of yourself so that hopefully you could then attract the man or woman who is worthy of your time. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and shows, I, I hold her as the iconic example for that. And I mean, it's, it's one of the most important pieces that she planted inside of me. For sure. Um, so, but, so but, I, but I mean, in, in, in recapping, I mean, like that's a long commentary and segue. One yeah. of the highlights of my life, and I had already been around Oprah many times at the governor's balls like I've been in many rooms with her yeah um and thankfully that freak out moment with Ray Liotta and Robert De Niro had already happened prior to seeing Oprah again because I like I got that geekdom out of my system right like yeah. I never I never did that again in my career of asking someone for an autograph um so I worked I was the lead on the AFI's celebrate you know the American Film Institute once a year ce celebrates, you know, an iconic figure. And th that particular year was Mike Nichols, uh, the director. And so I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but there is a beautiful head table in the center of the room and it was filmed at Sony Studios. And so clearly in between commercial breaks and all of that, you'd have people come, you know, like just ver very, very, like, people come to his table to congratulate him and all of that yeah. and of course you know Oprah and Diane Sawyer are very close friends so it was obvious that Oprah would come and say hello to them yeah. and 
it's so funny because I'm drinking like a chiffon peaches sort of can of beverage right now. And Oprah that night was the most radiant in this like peachy chiffon gown. I mean, she just looked exquisite. Like I would say that peach is one of her colors because she just looked like a queen. And I was in charge of like his table and she came up which was, you know, like I, it was just a normal thing. I mean, I've seen, I've been around her many times, so it wasn't like, oh my God, my Oprah moment. Yeah, but, for sure. when, at, but as she left, there was kind of like a staircase going down to the table where she was going to be at. Yeah. And I took her hand, like she looked, you know, just natural common courtesy. Um, I offered my hand to help her down the staircase because you know the gown was long and of course I didn't want her to fall yeah. and so she she held my hand and she probably never remembered me but like to just have Oprah touching me like it was just you know and those aren't like big things to me they're not like yeah. I've been I've been around everyone but yeah. again I mean it, the people in my circle know what Oprah means to me and so that that was a great moment that was a really great moment Amazing, amazing. So yeah. the follow-on to that is, um, uh, as a woman um, in this entrepreneurial landscape, do you feel in your profession that being a chef has changed um, and that there are more opportunities? So do you feel, because I know certain, a lot of women say, you know, certain industries are very male-dominated and, uh, you know, so did you find that in, in you know, in 2019 or maybe the last two years, you know, especially with digital and social media and all of that, do you feel that um, women um, are, are more in leadership roles? Um, no, no, no. We're not even close. No. We're not, we're not even close. Like when I started... Um, at the Ritz Carlton, there were more than sixty. There were more than sixty people collectively in the kitchen, yeah. and you know, ranking in all different positions. Sixty people, and there were only two women, and I was wow. one of them. Wow! And that was, you know, twenty-eight years ago. That wasn't that long, long ago. No. Now, flash forward to today, for sure, with the heightened awareness of the Food Network and a lot of cooking shows and, you know, like you see, you see the faces of celebrity chefs and many of them are females. But if you actually go into restaurants in New York or Los Angeles or any of the metropolitan cities, or, yeah. or just, if you just canvas the United States of America and go into, you know, hundreds of restaurants, which I have done. Yeah the numbers are still not there, not even close, yeah. not even close. And especially when you're talking about on the executive level of having executive chefs be yeah. females, it's not even close. It's not, there's no way. Okay. Like, there's no, there's no way. And uh, so, I mean, I want to just say really quick, it speaks sure. to just the industry in general, because for example, I mean, for years now, I've wanted to design my own uh, chef's coat specifically for women Yay. because now, I mean, there are more companies that have created colors that are specific to women, be, yeah. you know, chefs, chef coats, but there's not one company in the world that has a chef's coat specifically catered to the woman's figure, Wow. you know, to, to the body of a woman. And I'm talking about worldwide because I've checked. I have checked. Um, and so to me, that speaks to, there not being enough women chefs around the world. Therefore, there hasn't been a smart enough company to cater to women chefs specifically in terms of like attire and what we should be wearing in the, in the kitchen. So is that something that you're going to be looking into doing? A hundred percent. I've been thinking about it for two decades now. Wow. A hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. So what would you say are some of the biggest lessons and learnings you experienced when starting your business? Um, and what were some of the biggest challenges that you experienced? Patience. 
Okay. It's at the it's at the centerpiece of the whole thing. Yeah. Like literally the whole thing. I mean, there's two there's two things for sure. Um, but patience is a killer. I am telling you, patience has been has been my biggest kryptonite. It has led me to making really short term decisions, making a ton of financial mistakes. Yeah. Um What's so interesting is one of the hallmarks to being a great business leader is relationship building. Absolutely. And that, Without that I can, yeah, that I can tell you I've mastered. Hands yeah. down, I'm super patient in building relationships because any relationship takes time. Mm -hmm. So it's so fascinating, the paradox of that, because I'm super patient in the parts that matter, like yeah. the relationship building. Absolutely. Um, but when it comes to, you know, because as a chef, quite honestly, I've been underpaid my entire life. Yeah. And I just have. I mean, it's an industry that is completely underpaid. Yeah. Um, until you get like to the celebrity chef level and you've got your brand and books and all of that jazz. Yeah. Um, but like until that. You, get there, you have to maintain and sustain it. And that's always a challenge in itself, right? Cor well, correct. Because even celebrity chefs come and gone and if and it's so interesting because i've spoken to so many classes of young people who just want to be a chef because they want to be a celebrity chef and i tell them that you're never going to make it yeah. you're never going to get to that point because there's so much work there's so many decades literally decades of hard work before you can even be considered to be a celebrity chef mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, the interesting thing about being a chef is that we're a band of pirates. I mean, we really are like, you cannot consider yourself a chef yeah. if you haven't earned it. And I'm telling you any chef who is worthy of wanting to get their, their approval or their validation, yeah. there's not one chef on the planet who will just give you that title if you haven't earned it. Absolutely. Yeah, like hands down. Like and you gotta start from washing dishes, yeah. scrubbing floors. Like it's and that's what I love about being a chef is that once you get to the point that you know you could call yourself a chef, yeah, it's because you know you've already gone through it all. Like you've you've earned it. Um Absolutely. well it's like anything. I mean it's the same like even if you look at media and publicity and you you know, I know just as a publicist as well, like people will come and say, oh, you know, I want to be on the cover of a magazine. I'm like, there's no way that's going to happen at this point unless you have done something so incredible that's impacted so many people and that you've actually done something to earn your right to be on that cover. So I completely right. relate. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And so, then, you know, so the other centerpiece, I mean, I do want to get this in because, you know, sure. patience, patience is at the top of it. But the other, and it's the something other, Gary speaks about, right? For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And the other piece that he's talking about more, and I have really lived it, is mindset. Yeah. Like, you know, entrepreneurship is like the new celebrity thing, right? Just oh, as I had sure. just as I had mentioned the, yeah. you know, celebrity chefs. It's like this wave of popularity. Yeah. Um but but the truth is that being an entrepreneur is be I, w I want to say just on the surface of being beyond impossible. Yeah. Like it's it's one sprinkle away from being impossible. Yeah. But it's not right. Like if you were built for it, if you, you truly had the DNA from a very young age and yeah. like you literally just the the thought of working for someone else like you get sick every single day like physically sick yeah um like unless you have those traits you're never gonna make it you're just yeah. not i mean it's it's and, and i think that, it's massive sacrifice it's massive sacrifice yeah. it's yeah. It's beyond lonely. I, I like. I don't even want to get into how lonely. It oh, is I relate. <laughs> Trust me, I relate. Because if you don't know how to be with yourself, um, and know how to be self reflect, uh, reflective and introspective, and trust your decisions and rely on your instincts. I mean, I would say that 
one of the hallmark traits that people don't talk about enough that you really need as an entrepreneur is to confide and trust in your own intuition. It's hands down the absolute compass of yeah. being a good entrepreneur. Absolutely. Like and it's, that's it's the one thing because it also requires so, a lot of self work, you know, and you have to also work a lot internally. And like you said, even in terms of mindset, a, a ton, a ton. And it's nothing yeah. that you could, will ever be able to read in a book. No. You cannot pick it up. You cannot, like, it's, it, it's one of those things that you're just born with. Mm. And, and, and it, it typically comes from people have gone through a ton of adversity that's why the most brilliant legendary iconic artists like andy warhol lady gaga you know like people who just have something special yeah. it's because they're so introspective absolutely and it's rooted it's rooted in having come from a lot of trials and tribulations absolutely um, both personal and professional, I take a hundred percent, and how you navigate that, and whether you're—I mean, bottom line, whether you're able to determine for yourself if your trials and tribulations are the things that actually become your catalyst, or the things that debilitate you the rest of your life. Absolutely. So, how would you how would you define leadership? And what do you think um, and believe this means as a founder and an entrepreneur? It means, I mean, I think there's books that even speak to this, but my mother taught me this just yeah. through the most simple act. And that is she literally ate last. I mean, and, and my grandmother taught us that. So we yeah. have, you know, I mean, the reason why I became a chef is we'd have Sunday dinners with the entire family. And so it was always a huge spread and a collective, you know, offering that everyone made a dish and all of that. But it was just always, the tone was always set. My grandmother always ate last. My mom always ate last. If it was a more, if it was, I mean like buffet style, it was, it was basic, right? There was always going to be enough food. Yeah. But if it was more like a dinner party where it was a seated thing, mm. we, you know, where you were serving plates to people, uh, I, my mom always ate last. Like she always made sure that everyone was fed first. It's amazing. And that to me, that is the mark of entrepreneurship. So that yeah. means you pay yourself last. That means you work for your employees. That yeah. means you put yourself last always, always. That, that, that's, that's, the, that's the mark of leadership. Everyone thinks that, oh, I'm going to be this leader and everyone's going to, you know, I'm going to have this notoriety and I'm going to have the spotlight. You're not a leader. No. But people like a, also look at things from too glamorous a perspective, but they don't know the blood, sweat, and tears that went behind building They have no they no. have no clue they have no clue <laughs> yeah. i mean but what's the mark of a great coach the mark mm -hmm. of a great coach is someone who focuses on his on his players absolutely you know if you see if you see a coach that's focused on doing more interviews rather than being in the trenches making their players better then that's not a great coach in my mind no but this actually brings me to another point, and I kind of wanted to to highlight this as well before moving on to the next question. Sure. Is, do you feel, because this is kind of something that's been an observation of mine recently. So, of course, there's always really good, valid content that is being put out and whatever. But I often find listening and just you know interacting and engaging with people that i think there's people that are spending way too much time watching all these motivational videos and listening to all these programs which i don't disrespect but it's like you say you know you either have to be the coach and the leader and you can't be right. doing something else all the time because that is not building your team or building your business so 
what is your take on all of this? Because I'm kind of finding it like it's just becoming a lot of noise. So it's right. almost like you have to become selective about what you want to actually engage. Well, I mean, there's, there's a real juxtaposition and a real paradox with that, right? Um, because sometimes you have it in you, like you've always had it in you mm -hmm. to be to be an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. So Okay, so I'll give you my personal life as an example. Um, because, I mean, again, I'll keep this short. Uh, sure. So I dealt with really difficult domestic violence for 10 years. I mean, like, I'm literally grateful to even be alive. Wow. To, to even have made it out. Yeah. And so now at 48, that happened in my 20s. So that's how I spent my 20s, being abused by a man, both physically wow. and, and mentally. Yeah. Like, for, te for 10 years. So sure. just, you know, just imagine all the great work that, that I had in me that my parents did and all of my family yeah. was now completely shattered by a man in my 20s. Yeah. It has literally taken 20 plus years now to dissect and recover from that. Yeah. 20 years. And it's um, hard. It's hard. It's. It's, wow. it's again, it's almost impossible. Most people in my circumstance of yeah. domestic violence mm -hmm. either go into another relationship that way mm -hmm. uh, or they get into a ton of behavior that's self destructive. Absolutely. I mean, like, so I, I say all of that and I'm gonna, I, I'll just cut that part off there because I'm saying that because it speaks to mindset, which is what I spoke about earlier. Yes. And because clearly I was with someone that shattered my self-confidence, like literally broke my self-esteem apart. Yeah. So whatever my parents and family had given me up until my 20s, I gone. completely I completely lost it. Yeah. And so now in my 30s and 40s, it took forever to yeah. tr try to find myself again. Yeah, and that healing process is a very long one. It is, and I say all of that because if it wasn't for people like Marianne Williamson, like Gary Zukov, like Wayne Dyer, like Oprah Winfrey, like Carlos Castaneda, like uh, Eckhart Tolle, and like Gary Vaynerchuk, I would not be able to have gotten through to the place where I am today. So. Yeah. I don't want to discard, you know, and Tony Robbins and Les Brown. Like, I, I, I feel like I have to just mention everyone. I mean, there's way yeah. more, but, you know, there's just key figures who have impacted my life at the right point and said the right thing that brought me back to myself. Because yeah. this is who I always was, right? Yeah. And so yeah. when yeah. bad things happen to us, yeah, we lose our way. Absolutely. and and hopefully you attach yourself to great thinkers and leaders who are well-intentioned, like all the people that I just mentioned, Yes. that are there to facilitate something, a word, an offering, a gesture, an example that you could hopefully learn from that will elevate and change your life. And all of those people that I mentioned did that for me. So I don't want to discard the the power and the value of reading the right information of following the right people but what i will say is the most important thing that was ever said to me was by marion williamson and yeah. she said it in 2004 because up until that point i mean i had already just geeked out in i mean like i literally lived in the self-help section of every Jeez. book <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? Because I was, yeah. I like, I had gone to therapy. It didn't work for me. Like that process didn't resonate for me. No. Um, I'm not disregarding its value, but it just didn't resonate with me. Yeah. Um, I've never it has believed to work it. for you. At the end right. Of the day. Yeah. I I never took medication, which I most certainly should have because I was in deep, deep depression. But yeah. I just was not raised with that philosophy of 
taking a pill to solve your problems. Yeah. Um, so I literally lived in every library and every bookstore in the self-improvement section. Wow. But to the point, and I was also just a conference junkie, right? I would go from one. We've all been there. <laughs> right. We've, we've all yeah. lived in that kind of pattern. But in 2004, Marion Williamson, it was a conference with Gary Zukoff and Marion Williamson. Yeah. And I will never forget, like to this day, like if she said it today, she looked out in the crowd mm-hmm. in my direction. So I just felt like she was looking into my eyes. Yeah. And she was there to, you know, talk about her speech, but she was also promoting a book, right? So who would ever think of saying this? She looks out in the crowd and she says, at some point, you have to put the books down and get to work. Yeah, true story. And oh my God, like she looked in my eyes and I just knew that she was talking to me. Yeah. But, but consider this. I mean, we're now in 2019. Yeah. That happened in 2004 it's taken a ton of work in between for me to really own that i believed it when she said it i believed in the power of what she said that you've got to put the books down and get to work but i didn't believe in myself enough yet yeah so do you think and that so, in that process sorry to interject but do you, do you think that in that process because Sometimes when you look at a situation, like you say, or you, you read a lot of books or you get a lot of counseling or whatever works for you, but did you feel at any point in that process that you were not living your best life or you were not living your fullest A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because I will tell you right now with complete confidence that hiding behind books is hiding. Of course. Going to conferences is hiding yes absolutely watching one more video on youtube is hiding hiding yeah and in the moment and but again it's so different for everyone like i could never it's never gonna make sense to anyone until they feel it for themselves not believe it like it has to you have to be able to feel it so deep in your soul that one day you wake up and it was not another piece of information that you watched or another video or yeah. another book or another seminar or another podcast. You literally wake up one day and you're ready. Yeah. And you're just ready. And, and I can't tell you when that's going to happen, no. but I can tell you the one thing that has been constant in my life is hope. I've never... I've never lost hope ever. Yeah, absolutely. I've never lost hope. So, and do you, you think that? Do you go think ahead. that self? Do you think that self forgiveness was part of that process? Because I think even though you know you were in that difficult period of your life, and right. that happened to you, I think that the biggest challenge that women have. I'm not saying men don't have it, but I'm saying women. The biggest challenge I feel that women have that go through whether they were beaten up, uh, raped, uh, sexually harassed yeah. in some way, shape or form, um, end up beating themselves up, blaming them, Poor saying children. I should have seen the signs, you know, but and well educated people. So it's not like even the people that are the smartest people in the world have gone through these kinds of situations and uh, do you think that self-forgiveness is one of the hardest things i will tell you next to there's only two things that change your life yeah that or that or there's only two things that hold you back in life there's only yeah. two and it's fear yes and it's not being able to forgive yourself hands yeah. down you want to change your life because here's the thing in i mean if we're talking about women specifically but i think that it's it's non-gender related specific for sure it is it is a human in instinct that we're generally givers and yes. so what i mean by that is that it's so easy for us as human beings to forgive someone else before we forgive ourselves absolutely 
I mean, like the, you know, the guy who abused me for 10 years. Oh my God. It was so easy. It was so easy to forgive him. Yeah. You know, because like I wrestled with it my entire life of yeah. what did I do? Where did I go wrong? What was yeah. my responsibility? You know, so, I mean, you could say that accountability is also like the third component, yeah. but you can't even hold yourself accountable before, like in order for accountability to even come into your vocabulary, yeah, you have to be able to not judge yourself to the point where you forgive yourself for Absolutely. your role, for your role in the entire thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, because clearly someone who's been raped or, you know, incest, like they didn't have anything, to, you know, or, or victims of crime, like what did they have to do with it? Nothing. No. But exactly. at some point you have to forgive yourself. Yeah. You, you have to let go. You have to relinquish the emotional trappings of that pain. Yeah, for sure. Because I, I will tell you, after a while, you hold on to it long enough. Yeah. And it becomes your your security blanket. Absolutely. And, and it's it almost be, like you default back into that story. Well, so, and exactly. Once yeah. this once these trappings of whatever happened in your life become your security blanket, you are stuck. Yeah. And, and you're not just only stuck, you get lazy. You yep. literally get lazy because it's a habit. Everything in life, both good and bad, is a habit. Absolutely. So this, vic this victimhood that mm. is your security blanket enables you to live your life being a complete, lazy, unchallenged human being. Yeah, for sure. I mean, let's not, you know, let's not sprinkle this with fairy dust. Bottom no. line, <laughs> at some point, sure. if you don't challenge yourself, you get lazy, you get complacent, and it's yeah. just very comfortable to play small. Yeah. And you also have to change the narrative because, you know, the narrative was something at one point, but it's like anything. If you if you want change, you you, right. you, know, you have to rewrite the script. So for sure. One hundred percent. Like you just you it's just you just have to realize that it was just a chapter. Whatever yeah. has happened in your life both good and bad yeah is just a chapter like you can't also rest on the celebrity of your life and like everything going wonderful no because it's, it's I mean, never ev like everything that. <laughs> everything everything is just a chapter absolutely so this leads me to the last couple of questions so um what what do you foresee the future and vision for your company and what mm -hmm. would be the advice to other female founders and startups? To forgive themselves, to not be so hard on themselves every day. And I'm talking about everything. Like, yes. you know, I think I'm probably one of the only people who has the courage to do a live stream without makeup, yes. without the hair, without the hair being perfect and the, the perfect outfit and the whole thing. And, you know, like I haven't had a manicure and I don't know how long I mm. love getting manicures and pedicures, but guess what? I don't have time. No, you know? And so if all of these little things of being so critical, self-critical mm. hold, hold you down, you're never going to make it. Like no. you're never going to make it. You'll never be significant. No, like you just won't. So, so what do you foresee the future and vision for your company? More, just more, more love, more giving, more content, uh, uh, more impact, uh, just more. Amazing. So the final questions. Um, yeah. So I read that you have a passion for community based, community based organizations. Um, yeah and have worked with an impressive list of names in the entertainment world. Please, could you share a little more about that? Well, then... I, love, I love doing speaking engagements. This year, I'm definitely going to go a lot heavier on that. Um, I love, you know, whether I get paid or not. I mean, it, it's just going to depend on my time. But I love speaking to kids, in particular teenagers. Yeah. Um, 
teenagers in particular, because they're now at the age that they can get into a kitchen, they can navigate through a kitchen, and it's safe, like safely. Um, yes. I, I love teaching even younger kids, but I don't necessarily want younger kids to hold a knife. I mean, I will do it if I'm with them and if their parents are going to be with them, but you yes. know, there's still a lot of safety issues with kids under nine or 10. Um, for sure. But definitely that age range and even kids who are, who go off to college, it's just such a joy for me when I could teach a young person how to make a shake, how to make something that will give them a level of independence yeah. so that ultimately when they go off to college or live on their own, they have some practical tools to learning how to feed themselves well. For sure. And it's a skill. It's a life skill. A hundred percent. It's a basic skill. Like, you know, when you think of the traditional institutions of education, they're not setting kids up with the most basic life skills absolutely how to balance, how to balance a checkbook right yeah. like, or the value more important the value of what money means the currency that is money and yeah. how to respect it like you don't learn that in school no um and you you know so many schools have now eliminated uh there used to be cooking classes in high school and so many programs and schools have eliminated it because they don't see the value of yeah. teaching kids the basics of how to feed themselves in a healthy way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So like I've given, I've spoken, I've partnered with Tavis Smiley uh, who has his own show on PBS in Los Angeles and he's had a wonderful uh, institute, uh, kind of a, an organization that every year uh, he's captured kids from all over the country. Like they have to submit a written essay of why they should be chosen. And so it's like a scholarship program of, you know, really elite kids in different schools. Yeah. Um, and so they've all come together at UCLA every year. I'm not sure if he still does that. It's his leadership Academy um, where he brings in also thought leaders on many different subjects. And so, I've worked with him for a number of years to, you know, give cooking demonstrations and, and talk to his students about the value of, of eating well. I've also, you know, partnered with like the American Heart Association and the Red Cross. And I've just done a number of different, you know, from also uh, corporations like Wells Fargo and other banks who brought me in, who've done like, you know, a fair like a a wellness fair for their company yeah. and i've Amazing. come in and yeah and i've done those kinds of uh speaking engagements as well the other one that um, i could recommend is uh kimball musk elon musk's brother mm -hmm. he's doing the whole plant to seed and trying to really help um kids in schools eat you know better and healthier so well my goodness i love i love that you said that <laughs> he has um an incubator program here in, yes. in New York that yes. I've, I, I mean, I've visited. It's extraordinary what they're doing. I mean, a few of them are my friends who are actual um, entrepreneurs. They've now gone on to, you know, continue their business endeavors. I absolutely adore what they're doing yes. absolutely. Um, in, that pro in that program. So yeah, and there's just many others. So hopefully I can get out into the world and, you know, speak to the right organizations that are doing good work. Absolutely. So the final question that I just want to finish off on is um, uh, what would be the three key pieces of advice uh, to any other entrepreneurs that you could share with others? Um, and what would those be? Okay, so we've already said patience, yes. mindset, and not being so critical of yourself. Uh, I also said trusting your instincts. Yeah. And you have to be comfortable being alone. Like you yeah. just have to be hyper independent because being hyper independent as an entrepreneur is so critical to, to again, your decision making and how fast the speed of your business is going to go. 
So, Absolutely. so that's five, uh, you know, being independent. And that also includes under that umbrella, being an independent thinker. Yes. Um, it's great to have collaborations and clearly you're going to be hopefully smart enough to attract higher level people who you could learn from in your yes. organization. But at the end of the day, no matter what brilliant insight people are giving you, your gut is, your gut has to be the compass. It just has to be. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, the, the two pieces of advice that Julia Child gave me, which is to always keep learning and yeah. to be humble. Like you have to be humble. Uh, we, we already I never forget on, where you come from. <laughs> never, like never. Like I just don't understand that. Like that would never happen to me. It just, it, I'm, it just would never happen. I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but that's not how I'm wired. That's not how I was raised. Um, I, many people, I, I think that, I think that humility gets misbranded because so many people have taken advantage yes. of that word. Uh, so, yeah. Well, thank but, you so much, Lizette, for your time. This has been an amazing interview. Um, thank you. And, uh, yeah, we will be in contact soon. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.